I'm honored to be here. In my part of the world, in North America, the so-called New World, philosophy programs are disappearing left and right, even in Catholic universities. So it is very it's gratifying, it's delightful to see here in the old world, leading the way, adding a philosophy department. Not so very long ago in the history of philosophy, one would have thought it unnecessary to argue that Plato's ethics had a metaphysical foundation or even what exactly that foundation is. Alas, this is not the case today. From Hans Georg Gadamer's famous pronouncement, Platon va kein Platonica, to Gregory Vlastros's equally misguided, Socrates was no metaphysician. Numerous 20th century scholars of ancient philosophy have busied themselves trying with increasing implausibility simply to ignore the evidence along with all the well-established canons of historical scholarship and to construct an account of Platonic ethics that either saves it from being a betrayal of exquisite Socratic insights or from being an embarrassing misstep preparing the way for the more sophisticated ethics found in Aristotle. Henry Sidgwick, in his highly influential History of Ethics, wrote, the ethics of Plato cannot properly be treated as a finished result, but rather as a continual movement from the position of Socrates towards the more complete and articulate system of Aristotle, except that there are ascetic and mystical suggestions in some parts of Plato's teaching, which find no counterpart in Aristotle, and which, in fact, disappear from Greek philosophy soon after Plato's death until they are revived and fantastically developed in Neo-Pythagoreanism and Neo-Platonism. If a philosopher maintains that Plato unfortunately betrayed or obfuscated the sharp psychological insights contained in the so-called Socratic paradoxes, or that he did not appreciate the liberating advancement made by Aristotle when he severed practical or normative science from metaphysics. That philosopher makes no historical mistake and only needs to be addressed, if one is so inclined, on philosophical grounds. But when a soi disant scholar of ancient philosophy declares that Plato had no intention of situating his ethical philosophy within a systematic metaphysical framework, such a travesty should not go unanswered. I, no more than anyone else, have any idea what was in Plato's mind at the time of his writing any dialogue. But at least I can read the dialogues, and I can read the works of those who were with Plato and not only read these dialogues, but were also a part of the oral tradition that flowed out from the academy. And my reading, identical to that of many, many perhaps here in this room, and to many others who are not, leads to the historical conclusion that Plato's ethical philosophy as presented in the dialogues and as transmitted throughout the history of Platonism and beyond is inseparable from his systematic metaphysics. Plato is a moral realist. A moral realist maintains that there are truth makers for moral propositional claims, broadly speaking. Thus, to say that something is good or bad, right or wrong, ought or ought not to be done, is for the moral realist to commit oneself to there being something like facts in the real world that make these propositions true or false. By contrast, an anti-moral realist will maintain that there are no such facts. Accordingly, the putative moral propositions are either nonsensical or universally false. The first view typically holds that these propositions are merely expressions of one's feelings or wishes. The second holds that, though these propositions are false, they have some meaning or value in exhorting people to some sort of behavior thought to be socially desirable. Such a view is sometimes represented as a modern version of Plato's noble lie. Not surprisingly, moral realists differ widely in their views on what the supposed moral facts are. Among Plato scholars, there is practically universal agreement that Plato is a moral realist. I here leave out of account that small minority of scholars who maintain that we cannot tell whether Plato is a moral realist or not because since Plato did not speak in propria persona in the dialogues, we do not know his views on the matter. This is not the time to address this position. I have done so elsewhere as have many others. <clears throat> 
Things truly get interesting when one begins to inquire as to what these so-called moral facts are for Plato. Having tried to execute due diligence in the research for my um, latest book on Plato's moral realism, in reading much or most, if not all, of the material that has been written on the subject, I can report with honest bewilderment that much of the literature divides between those who, though they are writing on Plato's ethics, say nothing on the matter, and those who offer some weak interpretation along the lines that Plato thinks that his claims in moral philosophy are true because of facts about human nature. So, for example, it is better to suffer than to do wrong is true because of the way that human beings are built. Doing wrong is something that ill befits our soul, just as unhealthy food ill befits our bodies. I say I find these responses bewildering because there is, in fact, no doubt whatsoever what the correct answer is to the question of the truth maker for Plato's moral realism. It is the superordinate idea of the good that is the sole foundation of Plato's moral realism. I shall in a moment turn to the texts of the dialogues themselves to demonstrate this. But let me reflect for a moment on why there is such a major disconnect between the texts and the interpretations, especially, I regret to say, in the English-speaking world. The least damning explanation I can come up with for why this is so is that the idea of the good does not seem to be, at least on the face of it, anything remotely like a practical guide to ethics. To say that you must do good and avoid evil is hardly a counsel that one could reasonably follow, much less build an ideal city on. So perhaps thinking that among the Socratic paradoxes in Plato's sophisticated psychology of human action, there is a more promising account to be had regarding the truth makers for moral propositions, the idea of the good is simply set aside, a mere emblem of commitment to realizing virtue both in private and in public life. As history of philosophy, this interpretation is obviously inadequate, even absurd, although at least it seems to arise from an authentic desire to read and understand the text. But in my part of the world, a much more common and pernicious approach is the following. Plato's moral philosophy has its roots in Socratic philosophy. Socratic philosophy is innocent of metaphysics. Because Socratic philosophy is innocent of metaphysics, a valorization of Socratic ethics can be unburdened of any attachment to Platonic metaphysics and all its attendant embarrassments. Here, bad philosophy is added to bad scholarship. There is no evidence whatsoever that any of the dialogues contain something that can be isolated as Socratic philosophy, even conceding that Socrates was a major influence on Plato. Indeed, the evidence we have is entirely on the other side. Aristotle testifies that Plato held what we now call a two-world metaphysics, ek neu, suggesting that it's starting from his youth, suggesting almost certainly that he held this view prior to writing any dialogues. Only one caught in the grips of some ideology could maintain that, if this is true, then Plato was simply concealing his metaphysics when he expressed Socratic philosophy. The bad scholarship is exacerbated by bad philosophy in the predictable interpretation that follows. The truth maker for Socratic paradoxical moral claims are just facts about human nature. It is conceded that there may be exceptions, but these are few and for the most part, it is simply prudent to be virtuous. Here, the rejection of historical scholarship leads even a fine philosopher like Terry Penner to make Platonic ethics pure prudentialism, as he puts it. You will no doubt notice that pure prudentialism is explicitly the position taken by Epicurus, the arch enemy of Platonism. It should give one pause, that one holding the prudentialist interpretation of Plato's ethics, that the most clearly anti-Platonic philosopher in antiquity, Epicurus, was himself explicitly a prudentialist. One may state the difference between Epicurean prudentialism and the sort of prudentialism that fits within Plato's larger metaphysical picture by pointing out that the former is defeasible and the latter is not. 
For Epicurus, as opposed to Plato, it is prudent to be virtuous, for the most part. When virtue does not result in pleasure, there is no prudence in virtuous behavior. Epicurus's position clearly reflects the position of Democritus. Another clear example of pure prudentialism that is particularly anti-Platonic is found in the fragment, in the Vatican fragments that we have, um, uh, when, when um, uh, Epicurus counsels people to be just um, as long as it's beneficial to you. Now, in the Republic, the governing question is whether or not it pays to be a just person. Glaucon and Edimantes urge upon Socrates the Herculean task of showing not only that being a just person is intrinsically more desirable than being an unjust person, but that the consequences of doing so are superior as well. Moreover, it needs to be shown that a just person who appears everywhere else to be unjust is treated accordingly and is treated accordingly, has a better life than an unjust person who appears to be just and is also treated accordingly. By the end of book four, we get an answer to the first part of the challenge. Justice is psychical health, and psychical health is as intrinsically desirable as is bodily health. It is odd, though, perhaps understandable given the above, that many scholars think that the challenge is actually met by the end of book four, even though more than half of the Republic, half of the dialogue is yet to come, and philosophy has not even yet been mentioned. But book five, six, and seven bring in the metaphysical heavy artillery, and if one is focused on not spoiling Socratic ethics with Platonic metaphysics, then perhaps it is best to mark books five and onward as mere Platonic excrescences on the this-worldly moral realism of Socrates. This approach obviously has attained some measure of respectability, and it, is countless, and it, is, it has countless variations. But to show that psychical health is a good alongside physical health is not much of an achievement at all. Many of Socrates' interlocutors, antipathetic to everything he says, could admit as much without any hesitation. Who doesn't value mental health? But the demonstration of the intrinsic goodness of something that everyone knows is good is not much of an achievement. There is very little disagreement across cultures and throughout history regarding the categories of human goods. Yet virtually all moral dilemmas and moral crises arise, surely, from conflicts of goods, when, for example, the pursuit of one good requires the abandonment of another. And what Socrates needs to show is that when there is such a conflict, say between preserving one's physical well-being by escaping from prison and preserving one's mental well-being by allowing oneself to be executed, one ought unhesitatingly to choose the latter. And in fact, the rest of the Republic is devoted exactly to showing that. Socrates says that the study of the good is the greatest study. It is the good that makes just things and other useful things actually become useful or beneficial. At the end of book one, Socrates bullies Thrasymachus into accepting his claim that a just person is happy and an unjust person unhappy. He adds that being unjust is therefore never more profitable than being just. Socrates concludes that since he does not know what justice is, he is actually in no position to know its properties, including whether being just is more or less beneficial than being unjust. Clearly, after the definition of justice in Book 4, the idea of the good is introduced to answer the question about the profitability or usefulness of justice. Further, he says that the knowledge of this good is the means to human happiness and the explanation for everything right and beautiful. And he says that no one can act wisely either in private or in public, without seeing the good. Finally, he says that for the good to be the first principle of ethics, it must be above uzia, that is, unlimited by being identified with this or that good. It is the idea of the good, and only the idea of the good, that provides the foundation for the moral claims that Plato has Socrates make. 
These metaphysical claims are inseparable from Plato's account of the truth maker for his moral realism. One can respect the scholar or philosopher who thinks that Plato has gone wrong here in making these claims. It is more difficult to respect one who as a matter of principle simply ignores the evidence that this is Plato's view and that there is in fact an enormous amount of historical evidence to explain what Plato means when he puts the idea of the good at the center of his philosophy. A common complaint among those who at least concede that prima facie there is some reason to believe that Plato's ethics has a metaphysical foundation is that the good beyond Uzia does not appear to be a part, to have any practical value at all. How can ex an exhortation to do good be taken seriously, much less as the central moral claim by a great philosopher? If good is universal, then it is not possible that something, say, some action, should be good for A and at the same time not good for B. The obvious parallels are found in the truth of mathematics. Another way to put this is to say that if the good is instantiated here and now, it is otios to add, for me, to the proposition that represents the good state of affairs. Thus, if benevolent kingship is good for Athens, then it is true, but also needs no saying, that it is good for me, an Athenian citizen, that a benevolent king rules. More interesting and related to the role of the good in illuminating the Socratic paradoxes, if it is good that I be punished for my wrongdoing, then it is good for me that I be punished for my wrongdoing. Conversely, if it is good for me that I obtain something or do something, then we can infer that it is good simpliciter, that this occur, and therefore good for everyone else. It may be true, of course, that something that is only minimally good for you, that something is extremely good for me. But that is enough to ensure that the production of goodness can never be a zero-sum game. How does this logical point about the universality of good yield heuristic? If I am right in believing that, say, just deeds are good owing to the idea of the good, then I can infer that they are good for me. Similarly, I can infer that it is bad for me to do an unjust deed. Then, my doing an unjust deed can never be in my interest. Plato surely believes this on any account of his ethics. In the Apology, Socrates explains how his daimon works. It turns him away from doing things, but never encourages him to do anything. Someone who believes that goodness is one thing and that life is not a zero-sum game is going to have a demonic devotion to not interfering in the lives of others. I am assuming, of course, that Socrates' vigorous practice of dialectic does not constitute interference. But on the prudentialist account, it does not follow that doing just deeds is in everyone's interest, even if justice, like all the virtues, is a species of perfection. Prudentialism can never, in principle, attain to universality, the universality that is provided only by the idea of the good, the unhypothetical first principle of all. Thus, I can never achieve my good by being unjust to anyone else. Clearly, knowledge of what justice is is crucial to the task of being just and of benefiting oneself. But this knowledge is only dispositive in determining action on behalf of my good if the form of justice participates in the superordinate idea of the good, which is the sole object of my will. Suppose that knowledge of what justice is includes, minimally, knowledge that intentionally harming an innocent person cannot constitute a just deed. If this is so, the heuristic indicates that one refrained from aggressing against anyone. Needless to say, agreeing to this would amount to a huge concession on the part of the tyrant. His devotion to the idea of life as a zero-sum game leads him to think that his own good can often only be advanced at the expense of others. Let us dig a little, dig a little deeper for a more problematic case. Someone employing a utilitarian calculus might argue that, A, if the greatest happiness of the greatest number is attained, then injustice done to the few is good. Or that, B, if the greatest happiness of the greatest number is attained, then no injustice is thereby done, whatever is in fact done to a few. 
It seems that on the basis of the universality of the good, Plato would reject decisively both alternatives. The first is rejected in Socrates' absolutist prohibition of justice in Crito. The rejection of the second alternative follows from Socrates' refutation of Thrasymachus' definition as the advantage of the stronger. This claim is rejected for all cases of the stronger, including the majority in a democracy. Attaining advantage for the majority presumably entails a disadvantage for the minority, that is, the weaker. Otherwise, it would be for the advantage of all. According to Thrasymachus, the advantage of the majority, if it is stronger, is just for all. Also, according to Thrasymachus, there is a sharp contrast between seeking one's own benefit and the good of another. The rejection of these alternatives as mutually exclusive by Socrates entails the rejection of B above. If this is so, here is a strong, albeit negative, heuristic based on the universality of the good. This heuristic is also sharply circumscribed since the possibility of doing something apparently good that has adverse consequences for someone sometimes is considerable. And the greater is the good that one aims to do, the greater is the chance of bringing about these consequences. In the face of this, one might attempt various strategies. For example, one might introduce degrees of goodness. So, one doesn't calculate whether doing something to A has or not a bad effect on B, but whether bringing about the combined result for A and B is on balance a greater good than not doing so. In other words, one tries to contextualize the effects of acting and shape the demands of virtuous behavior accordingly. Alternatively, one might introduce a doctrine of unintended consequences or of double effect. According to such a doctrine, if, something, if doing something good to A has the unintended effect of producing something bad for B, then this does not count as a failure of virtue. Admittedly, both of these strategies are fraught with possibilities of abuse. It should also be noted, however, that truly unintended side effects of one's behaviors, if they are unforeseeable, cannot, ex hypothesis, be a part of a calculation regarding doing good and avoiding evil. But often, and especially at the political rather than the personal level, unintended side effects are reasonably foreseeable. At this level, it is difficult to see how an absolutist prohibition of wrongdoing would not be violated. The cascading consequences of behavior and the circumscription of the first heuristic suggest a certain skepticism about instantiating the good, or at least of trying to do so via laws or rubrics. Understandably, Plato hoped that a philosopher with knowledge of the good would be best placed to make circumstantial judgments about how the good should be brought about case by case. Yet success in this endeavor diminishes as a potentiality, potentially affected group grows in size. A second heuristic for the instantiation of the good follows from the necessary absolute or unqualified simplicity of the unhypothetical first principle of all and from its being identified with the idea of the good. As Plato says in Republic, the virtuous person becomes one out of many. There is, of course, much more that can be said about the evidence for Plato's identification of the good with the one. And the almost complete inattention to this evidence, especially on the part of those who deny the metaphysical foundation of Plato's ethics. For now, it should suffice to indicate that unification according to kind or integrative unity is a standalone criterion of goodness for Plato, even though its, effects, its effective implementation depends on having at hand definitions of the natures whose unity is sought, including species of living things and forms of association like a state or a family. The optimal state for any natural or even for any artificial construct is integrative unity. A clear example of how this operates is found in Gorgias. Therefore, Socrates says, it is due to order that the virtue of each thing is something that is ordered or arranged, isn't it? I would say so. Therefore, when a certain appropriate arrangement comes to be in each thing, that provides the good of each of the things that are. It seems to me so. This appropriate arrangement is synonymous with what I am calling integrative unity. Its name 
It's nature, integrative unity maps the steps in nature, sorry. Integrative unity maps the steps from endowment to achievement, from the kind of thing one is by nature to the fulfillment of that nature. The diversity of types of integrative unity once again indicates the necessity of the first principle of all to be beyond Uzia. The good or one is a principle of integrative unity and in its absolute simplicity it is beyond any need for an integration of parts. But for this to be more than merely notional, the good or one must be, as Plato says explicitly, the source of the being of everything that has the complexity of an existent with an essence. In eternity, endowment and achievement of integrative unity coincide. In the temporal world, where being is spread out across time and space, integration is not inevitable, but it is only the only way the good is achievable. The third heuristic is offered in Philebus, where we learn that the good cannot be grasped on its own. So, says Socrates, if we are not able to capture the good in one idea, let us get at it with three, with beauty, symmetry, and truth, and say that we would be most correct to treat these as in a way one, and responsible for what is in the mixture of the elements of good life, and that it is owing to this being good that it becomes so. Again, there is a great deal more to say about this passage and how beauty, symmetry, and truth together serve as a guide to the good. Here I only want to emphasize that this triad is potentially the most powerful heuristic of all in determining whether or not the good is being instantiated. It indicates implicitly integrative unity. Treat these as in a way one. But it also indicates the relational properties of truth, beauty, and symmetry. Truth is the property of being in relation to our intellects. Beauty is the property of being in relation to our desire or appetite. And symmetry is the property of being in relation to authentic imaging of it in the sensible world, imaging of being. Thus, in relation, in reflecting on the truth, the beauty that attracts us and the symmetry of the parts of real images of forms, we have something like a guide to action. The above three heuristics help explain how the good is indeed the normative as well as metaphysical foundation of Plato's system. It is perhaps worth considering though what options are available for reconstruction of Plato's ethics without a metaphysical foundation. I have already mentioned the pure prudentialism of Penner, which in my view fails to address the textual evidence for Plato and Socrates' ethical absolutism. When Socrates says at the Crito that one must no, in no way do injustice, he is not, I would suggest, offering a counsel of prudence. I think this is evident when Socrates confronts Callicles and Gorgias, for Callicles is more than willing to admit that just behavior is prudent for those lacking the wit or the will to dominate others. I take it that Plato's adducing the example of the tyrant, or the would-be tyrant, just as is adducing the example of the professional sophist, is supposed to alert us to the fact that everyone in extremis is at least prepared to consider that he or she is an exception, and that, after all, there may be benefits to tyranny. This is exactly what we find in the unnamed person at the end of the Republic, Book 10, who is, as Socrates says, virtuous, by habit, without philosophy, anoi philosophias. He chooses the life of a tyrant, though he comes to regret it bitterly. The philosophy that he is said to be without is, of course, the philosophy that in the fifth book of Republic is entirely concerned with perfect being, and in the sixth book aims to ascend to the idea of the good in order to attain a dialectical understanding of the intelligible world. These texts, among many others, seem to me to render prudentialism in any form a dead letter insofar as Platonic ethics is concerned. To be fair, most scholars who eschew metaphysics do not embrace prudentialism. Instead, they typically try to squeeze out of the analogy between psychical health and physical health what I would call a kind of naturalistic normativity. By far the most common interpretative approach along these lines is eudaimonism, broadly speaking. Specifically, the interpretation holds 
that for Plato, virtue is both necessary and sufficient for happiness. It is on this basis, of course, that scholars typically note an affinity between Platonic ethics and Stoic ethics. I do not dispute the attribution of eudaimonism to Plato. I dispute the claim that one could provide a sound argument for it while eschewing metaphysics. Moreover, and more to the point, I strenuously dispute the claim that there is no evidence in the text to support the view that this is exactly what Plato thinks. Unless the claim that virtue is a necessary and sufficient condition for happiness is taken as an empty analytic truth, one wonders how in the world Socrates or Plato could convince a Thrasymachus or a Callicles that the good they seek, the happiness they desire, could only be achieved if virtue is not regarded as one good among many, but as the only good. In other words, they have to be persuaded that the good for themselves that they admittedly seek can only possibly be achieved if they do nothing that requires privileging another good, say pleasure, over virtue. Not even once. By contrast, if the focus is shifted to the unhypothetical first principle of all, which, as we have seen, must be a pekinates usias, then it follows that the good that I seek is only real and not apparent if the presence of the good is not at the same time bad for anyone else. Because the idea of the good makes virtue useful or beneficial, virtue is the instrument of the good that is sought. That is, the good that is sought comes ultimately from the idea of the good, not from virtue. It is the idea of the good alone that guarantees the unqualified efficacy of virtue for the attainment of happiness. If this were not so, then one could allow that virtue does indeed necessarily bring a good to the soul, but that the fact does not settle the question of whether the pursuit of virtue to the exclusion of any other good guarantees the happiness that one seeks. I suppose that it is diffidence about the metaphysical foundation of Plato's ethics that leads scholars to confuse the good that virtue is with the superordinate idea of the good. If we approach the putative non-metaphysical ethics of Plato under the rubric of Socratic intellectualism, we attain a similar unsatisfactory result. The hallmark of intellectualism in all its variations is that knowledge is in some sense both necessary and sufficient for virtue. Much is made of the supposed similarity between knowledge and craft, techne. So it is easy to conclude that the knowledge that the philosopher seeks and the virtuous person possesses is knowledge of good and bad, that is, knowledge of how to bring about good and avoid bad in one's actions. This interpretation draws its strength from the fact that at a superficial level, it is of course true that Plato thinks that a virtuous person will be able to bring about good and avoid bad in his life. But the interpretation begins to lose credibility when we focus on the ambiguity of good in the claim that the relevant knowledge is of this. On the one hand, if knowing how to do the virtuous thing in some circumstances is what knowledge of the good amounts to, then it still leaves open the question of whether bringing about the good that the virtue is supposed to bring about is good for oneself. For example, if the knowledge is of what in a particular circumstance courage requires, that does not even begin to tell me whether it is good for me to be courageous. I think that those who ignore Plato's metaphysics in promoting Socratic intellectualism simply cling to a pious and rather endearingly naive hope that the courageous will prosper and the cowardly will suffer. On the other hand, if the relevant knowledge is of what is really good for me in this circumstance, one wants to be certain that what is good for me can never be bad for anyone else. If this were not the case, then it is entirely possible that the relevant knowledge could be of how to do the vicious thing if that achieves my good. It is only if the good that the knowledge is of is made to be good by the idea of the good, which is a pecking the taste of Zias, does it follow that this is what I will necessarily choose to do. That is, only if my good and the good are identical does knowledge entail virtue. This is why the mathema of the idea of the good is megaston, and why Plato imagined a decades-long education as preparatory for its, the attainment of its goal. This means, however, that the knowledge that is virtue is not a techne at all. 
which is always focused on the sensible and contingent world. On the contrary, it is just what Plato says it is, cognition of forms which is only possible in the light of the good. This makes little sense if the good is not the one, and the knowledge is just the synoptic dialectic that the philosopher is supposed to practice. It is knowledge that the good is the principle of unification in all things. It is only this knowledge that makes intelligible the claim that the virtues are a unity, that apart from the mere practice of the virtues by road or command, all true filler, philos or philosophical virtue is nothing but the manifestation of the knowledge that the good is one and that it is not possible to attain one's own good at the expense of anyone else. Terry Penner wants to distinguish Socratic ethics from Platonic ethics on the basis of what he calls Socratic intellectualism, which characterizes the former and is rejected by the latter. Penner characterizes Socratic intellectualism as a belief-desire theory designed to explain voluntary action. According to this theory, desire is for whatever constitute one's own real good and also for whatever action is the really best means for attaining that end now. Thus, the only way that someone voluntarily deviates from the appropriate action is owing to a change of belief regarding which action will attain the desired end. It follows that the only reason for failing to act in a way that attain one's own good is that one holds a false belief, that is, a false belief about the means to one's own real good. The ethical consequences of this theory are virtue is knowledge, specifically the knowledge of good or bad. Vice is ignorance, and no one errs willingly. Finally, knowledge is more stable than belief because belief can be overcome by pleasure, whereas knowledge cannot. Penner takes this theory to be pure prudentialism, as I said. That is, there is no distinction between the good that maximizes happiness and a moral good a good that conceive, could conceivably conflict with the maximizing of happiness. Since there is no such distinction, Socrates is an ethical <coughs> egoist. For him, it is inconceivable that my good should ever conflict with the moral good, as, for example, a Kantian would argue. As we saw in the previous uh, pages, Penner is right about the absence of such conflict, but only on the assumption of a first principle of all, that is the idea of the good. For Penner, a science of good and bad is a supreme human science, but it is not the science of dialectic as described in Republic Book VI. It is the practical science of how to live, and it is for this reason that the unexamined life is not worth living. Penner, like Vlastos, assumes a question-begging grouping of the dialogues supposedly manifesting Socratic intellectualism, though Penner is admirably forthright in expressing his inability to make Gorgias fit into his theory. My principal objection to Socratic intellectualism, as articulated by Penner and many, many others, is that it is just as true for the Platonic dialogues as it is for the Socratic dialogues. In other words, because Plato's ethics is intellectualist in some sense, there are no grounds for sharply separating it from Socratic ethics. And since Plato's ethics explicitly rests upon a metaphor, metaphysical foundation, so too should we suppose that Socratic ethics, as presented by Plato in the Dialogues, rests upon the identical foundation. Penner believes that one of the most firmly grounded elements of his theory is that Plato abandons intellectualism a favor, in favor of what he calls irrationalism. This irrationalism rests upon Plato's argument that acrasia, or incontinence, is possible. Because it is possible, people can act otherwise than for what they believe is in their own interest. So, whereas intellectualism finds the key to happiness in having true beliefs about what produces happiness, irrationalism requires, in addition, the training of the appetites in order to prevent their thwarting the realization of one's true beliefs. It is far from clear that we need a rejection of the phenomenon of acrasia in Protagoras, a dialogue Penner regards as Socratic. Even if this is not so, what I do want to argue, in addition, is that Penner is wrong in thinking that Socratic intellectualism is negated by what he calls Platonic irrationalism. If this is true, then there is no need to separate metaphysics from intellectualism. Indeed, there is every reason to insist on their inseparability. It is troubling, to say the least, 
that Penner's strong contrast between intellectualism and irrationalism relies on an interpretation of republic according to which an affirmation of irrationalism and an affirmation of intellectualism are found within a few pages of each other. The main problem with Penner's position, I think, is that he uses the word rationality in a way that does not in fact correspond to Plato's usage. Permit me one final reflection on the immense divide between those who, like myself, who embrace what can accurately be called the traditional view of Plato's ethics and its metaphysical foundation, and those who dismiss this view in no uncertain terms. In contemporary philosophy, experts in ethics and experts in metaphysics have little contact. It is widely assumed that these areas have only a remote connection, much like that which connects, say, ophthalmology and orthopedic surgery, namely the general principles of anatomy and physiology and so on. In this analogy, logic or the principles of reasoning is the remote connector between or among the branches of philosophy. In this paper, I have not argued that this approach is false, although in fact I think it is, nor would I argue that those who have little interest in the history of philosophy can be expected to be attuned to the existence of philosophical assumptions different from their own, especially as these are found in the distant past. But there is, I would argue, no similar excuse for those who profess ancient philosophy, and especially Plato and Platonism. Plato, as his writings amply demonstrate, is innocent of any assumption of the autonomy of ethics. It certainly does not speak well of a historian of ancient philosophy to suppose otherwise just because he finds it comforting or satisfying to do so. The idea of the good or the one is the starting point for all Plato's philosophy. I would say that this is especially so for his ethics. To suppose otherwise is to abandon oneself to one of the countless dead ends currently found on offer in Platonic scholarship. Thank you. <laughs>